What's tomorrow going to be like? What kind of houses are we going to live in? How will the homes of tomorrow be built? How much will they cost? What about housing projects in large cities? What about prefabricated houses? What about jobs in the construction industry? The Tomorrow Department of Army Navy Screen Magazine decided to take a look into the housing situation to try to give you some of the answers. Today, as never before, the United States is thinking about housing, planning for it, talking about it. Need for new housing and construction of every kind is at peak level. For four years, no building of any sort, except that directly connected with the war effort, had been done. And now the demand for all kinds of living quarters has piled up so high, a million and a half new homes are scheduled to blossom forth every year for the next 10 years. 15 million new homes. And Americans are in a position to pay the bill. Yes, economically, America is ready. And the architects, planners, and builders are ready with new ideas they've been developing during the war. More metropolitan housing projects, low-cost prefabricated houses, custom-built functional homes, new living quarters of every kind to fit every need. Americans realize that slums like these can no longer exist, where 10 million of our people still live in squalor and darkness, where future citizens grow up without sunlight and fresh air and space to play. 40% of American homes are still without modern plumbing. 20% are without gas or electricity. One third of the citizens of the richest nation in the world is ill-housed. But already slums in some metropolitan centers are coming down, condemned by forward-looking civic governments. Down they're coming, the cold water, no light tenements. Down are coming the bad living conditions that produce bad citizens. The underprivileged families from the dark areas of our cities are being moved into the sunlit, tree-surrounded, clean apartments of gigantic housing projects produced by city planners as investments in democracy. Cities within cities, scientifically planned and built, where a man and his family with a small income can live with comfort and dignity where there are playgrounds and space for the kids to stretch their growing limbs right outside the front door, where shops and stores are a planned part of the city within the city. Everything from the corner drugstore to the local movie theater. Even an automatic laundry, where Junior waits outside while Mom finds the family wash can be done in five minutes for a quarter. Such a housing project as this is the result of planning. Planning so that any five-year-old can scamper to his heart's content without fear of city traffic. Planning so that the rate of disease goes down and the rate of happiness and health goes up. Inside, every room has light and air, fresh paint, heating and modern plumbing, and all at a rent no higher than was paid for a cold water tenement. There are other plans, too, for better living conditions. During the war, research has gone ahead on new building materials and techniques in preparation for the American building boom. Every day in testing laboratories throughout the country, men and women are working to develop new ways to build better and cheaper living units with shatterproof glass bricks, chemically treated synthetic fibers, laminated plastics, reinforced plywoods, roofing materials and curtain wall boards, which will be lightweight but winterproof and strong as metal.
metals such as this light gauge steel, which can be hammered and nailed like wood. And out of the war itself have come new tools and materials for the builders. Materials like plexiglass for the gunner's turret will find innumerable functions to perform in tomorrow's home, which itself may be factory made, ordered right out of a catalog. Prefabricated is the word for such houses. The parts of the house are stamped out like airplane or automobile parts, crated, shipped, and set up at a price almost anyone can afford. Houses such as these were assembly line made, proving the theory of many a planner that the assembly line principle, which results in low cost and great quantity in everything from toothbrushes to liberty ships, can be applied to the building trades as well as other industries. The difference in cost between such a prefabricated house as you see here and a custom built house is the same as the difference between an assembly line built car and one built to an individual's specifications. Prefabricated houses are one way to low cost living on a high standard level. Mass produced houses built and bought as you would buy a car, fit for either city or country way of life. Here's a completely prefabricated farm, even down to the barn, which many a GI will easily recognize as his old friend, the Quonset hut, which is more efficient, cheaper to erect and maintain than the old red barn. Inside with stalls on rollers, space is saved, and the whole unit is efficient and compact with such new ideas as fluorescent lighting, paying off in increased chicken production. Another major development in housing is the pre-assembled mass-produced house, like these homes. All the elements were machined by factory methods, but were put together by standard methods in groups on the site. This kind of housing might be described as midway between prefabricated houses, which fit together like an erector set, and the old style completely hand-built houses. Entire towns like the famous secret city of Oak Ridge, where the atom bomb was manufactured, were built of houses like these. And the interior of these homes of tomorrow will sparkle with as many labor-saving devices as an advertising writer's dream. Efficient and pleasant, they will be clean, well-lit, skillfully planned, easy to maintain. The prefabricated houses and the pre-assembled houses are still in the experimental stage, waiting for the final word from the men and women who are going to do the buying and the building, and changes in certain city building codes which prohibit the use of many new materials and methods. And the planned community and housing projects, too, are in an evolutionary stage, waiting for progressive city governments. Yes, there are many questions about future housing still unanswered. But one thing is sure. The housing boom is going to mean jobs, lots of them. A million and a half new homes a year for 10 years. million existing homes need major repairs and improvements right now. All this adds up to jobs. And for every man working on the building site, two men are employed behind the scenes making building materials and tools. And for every housing unit constructed, men will be needed to build the furniture and run the machines to make the curtains, carpets, kitchen equipment, and the million articles which are needed in a modern house. Just as the automobile brought about a huge new industry after the last war, 
housing can be the big new post-war industry in our time. Across the face of America will spring up planned communities, great housing projects replacing city slums, communities of cheap but comfortable and healthful homes, away from the city factories and smoke. Across America will rise homes for the citizens of this country which are worthy of them. Through history, Navy men have worn a variety of colorful uniforms. But today, the sailor's uniform, like his ship, has been scientifically streamlined. The blouse, a uh, jumper, is tailored of 18-ounce bat-dyed navy blue melting cloth. The cuffs and collar are of the same material. Uh, <clears throat> the cuffs and collar are... Oh, well, perhaps we better go aboard ship and have a look around. Well, here's Seaman Tarfu. He'll help us with our little uh, demonstration. Oh, yes, the jumper. The Navy man carries very little on his person. Therefore, the jumper has only the one small pocket, which, however, is adequate for all his personal effects. Hmm. The less said about a sailor's pants, the better. The jumper, although snug fitting, was designed to be easily removed. Grasping the lower seam between the thumb and forefinger of each hand and exerting a gentle upward pull before our sailor boy can say, heave ho the mizzen mast. Uh, heave ho the mizzen mast. Heave ho the mizzen mast. There, it's off in a jiffy. Man your battle stations. Man your battle stations. Navy craft are always kept immaculately clean. <laughs> and whatever natural hazards may be encountered are always handled with true Navy efficiency. Of all Navy traditions and ceremonies, the most colorful is that of piping the Admiral aboard. Another Navy tradition is that of growing a beard on long cruises. But it must conform to regulations. Hmm. The regulation clearly states the hair, beard, and mustache must be worn neatly trimmed. The hair, beard, and mustache must be worn neatly trimmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what is a sailor without a tattoo? Super Dreadnought boasts a completely equipped meteor, uh, meteor, meteor, uh, weather forecasting laboratory. Hmm, wonder what the weather's going to be tomorrow. Uh, 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 looks like a storm to me. Seriously, however, Navy equipment is the finest obtainable. And though a sailor must still take his turn at standing watch in the crow's nest, he has at hand the most powerful binoculars in the world, enabling him to see through solid banks of fog, mist, and rain even beyond the horizon. Fresh. In
conclusion, of course, no picture about our Navy would be complete without some appraisal of the American sailor as a fighting man. Let's hear from a recognized authority on this subject. What'd you expect, sailor? The army made this picture.